I'm Jacob McDonough, founder and portfolio manager of McDonough Investments. I manage a concentrated portfolio of stocks for clients in a separately managed account structure. In this episode of the 10K Podcast, I'm going to go through the 1932 annual report for the General Motors Corporation. In the 2023 annual shareholder meeting for Berkshire Hathaway, which took place earlier this year in May, Warren Buffett said that he was recently reading the 1932 annual report of General Motors and that it was one of the best annual reports he's read. Well, that caught my attention. Warren Buffett has read his fair share of annual reports, and this one in particular stood out to him. Once I heard that, the 1932 annual report of General Motors went to the top of my list in terms of reading material. Near the beginning of the annual report, it says that, quote, In addition to the usual treatment of the subject, there has been added a review of the effects of three years of the current industrial depression on the corporation's operating position, end quote. In the final episode of the great TV show, The Office, Andy Bernard says, I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. Along those same lines, I've always wondered when exactly people knew they were in the Great Depression when it was actually happening. When I look up the history of the Great Depression, the years listed range from 1929 to 1939. Here we are in 1932, and management mentions how they are three years into an industrial depression. Well, there you go. Management went on to say that, quote, It was stated under this heading in the annual report covering the year 1931 that the automotive industry, constituting the most important part of the corporation's sphere of activity, as well as industry in general, suffered a declining trend and that the close of that year showed no substantial evidence of any improvement in that trend. This statement of fact, applicable to 1931, is all the more true with respect to the year 1932, during the first half of which the rapidity of the decline was greater than at any previous period since the Industrial Depression commenced, end quote. From 1929 to 1932, the entire auto industry saw its total production in dollars decline by 78%, and the number of units sold was down 75%. Things weren't much different at GM, as the company had a decline of over 70% in both units sold and in terms of revenue. Company saw its revenue decline by 37% in 1930, then by 10% in 1931, before dropping another 48% in 1932. The level of production hadn't been this low since 1918, which was 14 years prior to this period. Management goes on to write that, quote, The principle has been recognized that conditions and circumstances have changed. To what extent they are of a permanent, or to what extent they are of a temporary character is not yet known, end quote. That is the scary part of living through a crisis. With hindsight, it is easier, but in the moment, it can be difficult to tell how much of the change is permanent versus temporary. Given all of this difficulty was on a legendary scale, General Motors performed really well during the early years of the Great Depression, especially if you compare it back to their performance in 1920 and 1921, that I talked about in the last episode. I'm going to come back to this comparison though. First, let me fill in some of what happened during the 1920s, which would be known as the Roaring Twenties. During this period, the car industry continued to prove itself as an industry. Management started out the 1922 annual report by writing the following. Quote, The automobile industry is notable in having passed through three distinct phases in a brief period of three years, and at the same time having transformed itself from a member of the luxury class to that of a prime necessity. To many, the culmination of the period of inflated prices in the latter months of 1920 marked also the probable culmination of the wide demand for automobiles, then commonly known as pleasure cars. At that time, growth in the use of automobiles was compared with and attributed to the period of inflation and extravagance brought about by the redistribution of wealth in the war years and those immediately following. 
Two years ago, the term pleasure car applied to all cars except commercial vehicles and properly described the then popular conception of the position of the automobile in modern life. The year 1920 witnessed the development of the automobile to its limit as a supposed luxury, with the natural accompaniment of careless and extravagant production and sales methods. Deflation following the year 1921 furnished two lessons. First, that the automobile, no longer a pleasure vehicle, had become a necessary tool, one which, as measured by its use in gasoline consumed, is not to be lessened in utility by the pinch of a severe financial and industrial readjustment. And, also, that the automobile, as shown by the registrations of 1921 and 1922, may be repaired and continued in use longer than normally expected. This first lesson was delivered not only to manufacturers, but to the public in general. The second lesson applied more strictly to those catering to the public. It was to the effect that the manufacturer and sale of the automobile as a commercial necessity must follow the same careful economic and resourceful methods as those found necessary in other standardized industries, end quote. I've mentioned this before, but there were plenty of skeptics during the early history of the automobile industry thinking that this was a fad. It obviously became ingrained as part of daily life. In the 1930 annual report, management had more to say about this topic, writing that, quote, It might be well to remind the stockholders of the fact that long ago, the automotive industry passed from one dealing with what was considered as a luxury to one dealing with a basic necessity, transportation. The motor car made available individual transportation at an initial investment and at an operating cost so low as to hardly be believed. The desire to move from place to place is a fundamental desire of every individual. Hence, the motor car, next to food, clothing, and shelter, has taken the first place in the budget of the individual. The thought has been advanced by many authorities, entirely within reason, that the automotive industry will lead the way to business recovery. End quote. While the industry had been battle-tested and had proven itself, General Motors itself was on the rise. Its position in the industry kept getting stronger and stronger. The company had a major jump in market share in 1927, though. The main reason for this was that Ford shut down its major production facility that year to retool and design a new car after the Model T had become obsolete. In the 1927 annual report, management noted that, quote, during 1924, the corporation manufactured approximately one car in every six produced in the United States and Canada. In 1925, this was increased to one car in every five. In 1926, again, to somewhat better than one car in every four was made. And in the year 1927, the corporation produced 44 cars out of every 100, or a little less than one out of every two. The sales of the corporation during the year under review represented by far a greater aggregate value and a greater number of total units than those of any other automobile manufacturer in the world, end quote. GM had 44% market share in 1927. General Motors was steadily improving its position in the industry. During the 1920s, the number of units sold grew at a compound annual rate of over 19% while revenue compounded at a rate of more than 11% per year. This meant that the number of units sold went from over 393,000 in 1920 to 1.9 million in 1929. Revenue grew from 567 million in 1920 to over 1 1.5 billion in 1929. The company sold 4.8 times as many cars in 1929 as it did in 1920, while revenue was 2.7 times higher over this time frame. The cost of a car kept getting cheaper for the end consumer, even though the quality of the product was increasing. Here's what GM had to say about this in the 1924 annual report. Quote, It has been, and undoubtedly will continue to be, the policy of the industry to share the economies flowing from increased production 
with the purchaser through either lower sales prices or betterment in quality, or both. At times, such economies have been anticipated and sales prices established that could only be justified by greatly increased volume. The time has come, however, when any great increase of volume must be gained not from additional reservoirs of new buyers or new markets unworked by other manufacturers, but on the contrary, from well-exploited markets intensely cultivated by all manufacturers. Under such circumstances, price reductions in the future face entirely different conditions from those which have prevailed in the past. Important economies have been affected during the year 1924. It is the policy of the corporation to pass on to the ultimate consumer economies that are affected in the form of betterment of quality, serviceability, and performance of product. The corporation today is giving the purchaser greater value for the dollar than at any other time in its history, end quote. Even though the sales price per car was getting cheaper, profits went up at an even higher rate from what I assume was the result of economies of scale and production. Management refers to economies that they achieved as they scaled. I'm unable to view this firsthand, though, as there isn't a full income statement during this period. I would have loved to see how gross margins changed during this time period and how expenses for corporate overhead fared as a percentage of revenue. Net profit margins could have more fluctuations than would be the case as you move higher up the income statement. And I'm curious how margins changed over time. For now, I'll have to work with what I've got. The company was able to grow its profits at a fast pace though, as net income was 6.6 times higher at the end of the decade, which was a compound annual rate of over 23%. As profits rolled in at GM, the cash on the balance sheet started to pile up. The company operated pretty conservatively from a financial standpoint. GM did spend money on CapEx, and they also made plenty of acquisitions. But the company had some excess cash that it decided to hold on to in most years throughout the 1920s. As I mentioned in the last episode, GM had a major inventory problem in 1920 and had to take on $83 million of short-term debt that year. The firm had some cash at that time, though, resulting in net debt of $36 million for GM at the end of 1920. The company became debt-free in 1924 and remained that way for the rest of the decade. By 1929, GM had cash of $127 million on the balance sheet without any debt. This turned out to be a wise move. Some companies feel the need to spend money as soon as they get it. The money is burning a hole in their pockets. This is what got some of the banks into trouble recently, like Silicon Valley Bank. Deposits flooded into Silicon Valley Bank in recent years, growing from just under $62 billion in 2019 to over $189 billion of deposits at the end of 2021. Deposits more than tripled in two years. This means that the bank had a ton of cash flow into it, and it got busy right away putting that cash to work. Instead of patiently waiting for the right investment, whether that was in the form of loans, stocks, or bonds, the firm put that money to work right away, mostly in long-term mortgage-backed securities. In the short term, this helped the bank keep its return on equity high. The longer the time horizon, though, the more this exposed the bank to risk from changing its interest rates. The bank reached for a higher yield, and this resulted in its failure. My point is that you don't have to be in such a hurry to put all your capital to work on day one. You can be a little patient. This kind of patience does hurt your return on equity, though, at least in the short term. General Motors was somewhat patient during the 1920s and allowed cash to pile up on the balance sheet. With that being said, the firm did make some moves, though. In 1929, GM spent $65 million on acquisitions. The firm acquired 80% of a German car company in an attempt to help expand its business in Europe. GM also acquired an interest in a few manufacturers of airplanes and airplane parts. The company also internally formed the General Motors Radio Corporation, as management recognized that, quote, General Motors 
already had technical ability, manufacturing capacity, and opportunities for distribution, end quote. In terms of distribution, I assume they plan to be the ones making the radio that went into each of their cars. GM also acquired a spark plug company, a Canadian car manufacturer, and a manufacturer of car starters and ignition systems. Here's a fascinating excerpt from the 1929 annual report as the country was entering into the Great Depression. Management wrote, quote, An operating review of the year would not be complete without mention of the fact that a new record was established by the automotive industry in the production of approximately 5.6 million motor cars and trucks, compared with 4.6 million in 1928, the best previous year. This very substantial increase was materially in excess of that indicated by what might be termed a normal trend. It was caused by the influence of several factors. In the first place, during a substantial part of the year, the country was favored with remarkable industrial activity and the greatest prosperity that had ever been enjoyed. Employment was at a high rate, high wages prevailed, purchasing power was at its maximum, and there was added, during most of the year, the psychological and practical influence of increasing security values. Further, a considerable amount of business normally applicable to 1928 was unquestionably carried into 1929 due to a shortage of motor cars during 1927 and 1928 in the low price field. As a matter of fact, the very substantial increase in volume during 1929 occurred almost entirely in the low price field. The record production of the earlier months of the year was followed by a lowering of production levels during the latter part of the year, giving consideration to the declining trend in general business activity, which developed during the last half of the year, and recognizing the very practical and psychological effects that might result from the very drastic reduction in security values, General Motors deemed it desirable to reduce manufacturing schedules of the corporation's properties, both primary and secondary, in a very material degree. A few interesting things from that excerpt. There was record production in 1929. Management talks about the country being favored with remarkable industrial activity and the greatest prosperity that had ever been enjoyed. This is how it felt just as the country plunged into the Great Depression. High employment, high wages, stocks keep going up. The pendulum was in the middle of swinging in the other direction. Also, when management talks about a shortage in the low price field, they are referring to the fact that Ford shut down production in 1927. Ford was a major player in the low price field. Last but not least, GM mentions here that they lowered production in late 1929. This was a very fast reaction to the Great Depression, which was a much improved response compared to the 1920 period. Back to the 1932 annual report. Net sales amounted to $432.3 million for GM, down 46.6% from $808.8 million. Units amounted to just about 563000 against almost $1.1 million in 1931, a reduction of 47.6%. GM earned just under $165,000 before preferred dividends in 1932, down from $115.2 million of net income in 1931. That was a major hit, from $115 million of net income to less than $1 million. It was a major hit, but the company was still profitable although just barely. How did the company respond? GM did cut back, but not in terms of R&D and not in terms of making technical progress. Management stated that, quote, such an important reduction in volume as is now being experienced injects into the situation important limitations of action. Notwithstanding such limitations, the policy will be in no way to to circumscribe the technical progress which must not only be maintained but accelerated, if possible. 
This is because around technical progress, the corporation's products must be developed, and upon the excellence of those products, it must be, it must depend for its share in a highly competitive market. The objective, therefore, must be the continual development of more attractive, more efficient, and more economical products, resulting in not only increased value for the dollar, but what is, but what is of even greater importance, values for a smaller number of dollars in harmony with the reduced resources of the various markets which are being served, end quote. So they are focused on surviving this downturn and limiting the operations of the business in terms of production and certain operating costs, while at the same time not sacrificing the, long, the long-term prospects of the company. They viewed R&D and technological improvements as essential to the business. Management wrote that, quote, The problem that a situation of this character presents to an institution like General Motors is to control its operations as well as to adjust its course so as to carry through the period, irrespective of how long or short it may be, in such a manner as to protect most effectively the broad interests of stockholders. By the broad interests of stockholders is meant maintenance of a strong financial position, continuation of a dividend disbursement, but only to the extent that the financial position is not weakened. Reduction in expense with lowered product costs, aggressiveness in improving the technical position and artistic conception of the corporation's products through advanced research and engineering, maintaining and strengthening of the company's personnel both in effectiveness and in morale, sympathetic cooperation with the problems of the dealer organization, and improving all relationships with the public all in order that the institution may go forward aggressively when the period of adjustment has been completed, end quote. Survival is first and foremost on GM's mind, but the company does recognize that an opportunity will come around knocking again eventually. Management notes that although sales are down, people are still driving at about a similar level. Management says that, quote, Total registration of motor cars has been but slightly reduced during the Depression period, and that gasoline consumption has been well maintained, reaching an all time peak in 1931 and recording a reduction of only 7.5% for the year 1932, demonstrates that there is being rapidly depleted an important amount of motor car mile inventory. End quote. So gasoline consumption is only down 7.5% in 1932, while revenue is down 47%. Cars in use are depreciating, so eventually people are going to come back and buy a lot of cars when the economy finally recovers. Management goes on to write that, quote, It is therefore not only reasonable to assume, but to expect with certainty that when the period of readjustment is over, the automotive industry will not only maintain its position as the world's most important industry, but its rate of recovery will be accelerated by the depreciation and obsolescence of existing equipment, which has taken place during the years of subnormal production, end quote. The best companies get stronger during the tough times. If GM can survive, some of its competition will be diminished during a downturn as strong as the Great Depression. The competitors that do survive might not have the financial stability to invest in R&D and product improvements, so GM can extend its lead over other car manufacturers by having the strength to keep investing in itself. General Motors was profitable all through the Great Depression up to this point, although profits were close to zero in 1932. GM earned $248 million in 1929, $151 $151 million in 1930, $97 million in 1931, and only $165,000 in 1932. So how was GM able to handle the Great Depression and remain a strong, profitable company? I just finished reading about how the abrupt economic downturn in 1920 and 1921 almost brought GM to its knees. The decline in GM's business was about the same in 1921 
as it was in 1932. As units sold and revenue both declined around 45% in both years, why was it different this time? Well, the decline in the earlier period happened in the late part of 1920. This led to the level of inventory, as well as the level of debt, at GM jumping in 1920, while the decline in revenue occurred in fiscal 1921. In the last episode I did on the 1920 annual report of General Motors, I mentioned that inventory reached $209 million in October of 1920. The company had to borrow $83 million of short-term debt against this inventory that it was unable to sell at the time, while having entered into purchase agreements with suppliers at inflated prices. This situation was not good. Management set budgets and inventory limits that were ignored by its subsidiaries. Management wrote that the troubles of this 1920 and 1921 period were, quote, directly related to loose and uncontrolled methods, which are now corrected, end quote. This statement would be put to the test during the Great Depression. In 1924, management wrote that it believed that they would be, quote, free from the evils resulting from excess accumulation of stocks involving unnecessary storage, interest, and carrying charges as well as drastic curtailment of production schedules, end quote. This turned out to be the case. In the 1924 annual report, management also talks about its past mistakes of immaturity. Now that the car industry is 26 years old, GM expects more maturity from the company and from the industry. This ended up being a pretty good explanation of how GM was able to fare so much better during the Great Depression. Here's what management said in that 1924 annual report. Quote, The motor car industry in evolution. It is still customary for the motor car industry to refer to itself and to be referred to by others as a new industry. In one sense, this is wholesome. That which is new is youthful, full of promise, open to fresh ideas, undismayed by obstacles, and quick to recover from its hurts. In another sense, however, there is danger in continuing too long to emphasize our newness. The man of 26 is no longer a child. He has almost, if not entirely, completed his physical growth. He has, or should have, put behind him most of the mistakes of immaturity. He should have finished his education, mastered his tools, and be fairly launched upon the second, more stable and fruitful period of his career. The motor car industry is 26 years old. All industries in their early years go through the same experience. The second quarter of a century ought to witness quite different conditions, end quote. In 1920, inventory on the balance sheet grew by over 60% from 1919 to the peak in 1920. Revenue dropped by 46% the following year, launching General Motors into liquidation mode. So what happened when revenue dropped by over 70% from 1929 to 1932? First off, 1929 was an interesting year. Management notes that business was booming for part of the year, and then the economy went into decline later in the year. All in all, revenue increased 3% in 1929. Inventory declined by 4% by the end of 1929. Inventory then declined by 28% in 1930, 22% in 1931, and then inventory dropped by another 29% in 1932. Cash increased on the balance sheet over this period from $127 million in 1929 to $173 million in 1932. The increase in cash happened even despite the fact that GM paid out dividends in 1931 and 1932 that exceeded net income. The company was able to achieve this result by reacting very quickly to the Great Depression. In the 1930 annual report, management wrote that, quote, Previous annual reports have dealt with the methods that have been established by the corporation with respect to the operating and financial control of its worldwide activities. In the middle of 1929, there was indicated a change in the trend of business activity. A period of readjustment was in process. 
steps were taken to alter the position of the corporation in harmony with the change in trend. As progress was made during that year, it would become evident that the readjustment would become one of magnitude. Action was taken to readjust the whole operating organization to a basis of reduced volume, resulting in improving the present financial position and earning power of the corporation, end quote. GM was slow to react to the downturn in 1920, but they had a completely different reaction in 1929 and 1930. Financial controls improved, the company became more organized, and they also got better at tracking retail sales between the dealership and the end consumer. Here's a great conclusion that management wrote at the end of the 1930 annual report. Quote, The experience of the corporation's operating organization has been broadened through the problems that have arisen and have had to be dealt with under the unusual conditions prevailing during the year under review. The organization is stronger and better as a result of this experience. While the financial returns were disappointing as compared with the more favorable results of previous years, it must be recognized that performance under such circumstances cannot be measured quantitatively in comparison with previous years, but must be considered with regard to the circumstances prevailing. Irrespective of what conclusion stockholders may reach on that point, the fact exists that, from many fundamental standpoints, the progress of the year was important and will have an influence on the future fully equal to years when the financial return was greater. Higher standards of efficiency with greater effectiveness have been established than ever existed before. The basis exists, therefore, for a more effective capitalization of the corporation's future opportunities, and the management has faith in the fact that the opportunities of the future are as great as those of the past. End quote. Basically, they are saying the results might not look great from the perspective of comparing previous years. Revenue was down and net income was down. With that being said, GM had a great reaction to the downturn of the Great Depression, and its management is correct in saying that the progress in the year was important and would influence the future in an important way. This set up GM to withstand the Great Depression and emerge even stronger. Their financial conservatism and their execution allowed them to be aggressive in its plans for the future, as management noted in the 1931 annual report. They wrote that, quote, In times of subnormal industrial activity, progress is always accelerated. It is not at all unreasonable to assume that during the next two or three years, the motor car will make greater advancement on all counts than it has during a much greater interval in the past. All of this is as it should be, because through the betterment of its products, industry increases the desire to possess and is thereby stimulated. The corporation recognizes the importance of these influences and is pushing forward aggressively. And as a matter of fact, it has expanded the research activities upon which the future technical position of its products depends. End quote. I'm going to repeat one sentence there. In times of subnormal industrial activity, progress is always accelerated. That's great. The best companies get stronger during the tough times. I keep harping on inventory, but this was an important part of GM's story during this period. Inventory reached $209 million in 1920, while inventory was just $75 million at the end of 1932. That is pretty incredible inventory control by General Motors. GM was a much larger company in 1932 than it was a decade earlier. This was a company that produced 1.9 million cars in 1929 and had revenue of $1.5 billion that year. In 1920, the company sold less than 400,000 vehicles and had revenue of $567 million. Despite this large level of volume, the company was able to smoothly readjust operations to handle a decline in volume during the early days of the Great Depression. Even though revenue declined quite a bit in 1932, GM still was a much larger organization than it was in 1920, and it was used to far higher levels of production. 
Another important story from this period was the performance of General Motors Acceptance Corporation, or GMAC. Bankers avoided making auto loans around the time that GMAC was formed in 1919. As I've mentioned, people thought of a car as luxury or as sport, so bankers figured that it would be a bad asset to lend against during an economic downturn. As Alfred Sloan wrote in his book, My Years with General Motors, quote, In 1915, about eight years before the automobile industry would become the largest American business in terms of volume of sales, its distribution system had no routine retail credit structure outside of a very narrow banking channel, end quote. This means that there was a gap in the market. Consumers demanded financing for the purchase of a car, but traditional banks were reluctant to fill this demand. This was the most important benefit that GMAC had during this time frame. The company also had a distribution advantage through their retail network of dealerships. GMAC made loans to the dealerships themselves to finance inventory, as well as to the end consumer driving the car. Additionally, GM had the manufacturing expertise and sales ability when the company was forced to repossess a vehicle. No one else would be better at fixing up a GM car than GM itself, and the firm would be in a better position than anyone to resell a repossessed vehicle. This would give the company a cost advantage over other lenders. Most importantly, drivers turned out to be credit worthy. All of GM's advantages in cost and distribution would not have been worth much if it was lending to people who could not repay the loan under most circumstances. This showed how important the car was in the life of the consumer. Many people needed that car to drive to work. It was also a major investment for many consumers, which means that they did not want to lose ownership of their car. At the end of the day, the amount of losses on auto loans was very low. Sloan wrote in his book that, quote, In the case of GMAC, the retail loss ratio on installment paper from 1919 to 1929 was approximately one-third of 1%. In 1930, it got up to half a percent, but in 1932, got up to five-sixths of 1%. So in the worst of the Great Depression, it never got to 1%, end quote. I believe he is discussing the charge-offs of loans and that loan losses never reached 1% of the total value of their loans. This is really good performance, considering it was on a lending activity that bankers thought was too risky when GMAC was formed. In the 1932 annual report, management wrote that, quote, the year's operations, while adversely affected by reduction in volume, nevertheless resulted in a substantial net profit. Credit losses have increased, as well as repossessions of cars, as compared with the more prosperous years of the past. Nevertheless, the credit and repossession losses are relatively small, which fact justifies the conclusion that even under the adverse circumstances, a sound foundation of consumer credit remains, end quote. They are saying that GMAC had a substantial profit in the midst of the Great Depression. This was a valuable, profitable business for GM, not to mention that it helped fuel the sales of new cars for the company. Now that I've gone through the annual reports of GM from 1918 through 1932, I want to circle back to one of my original questions. How could such a dominant company like Ford, with their Model T, lose their top spot? Ford and its Model T had 60% market share in 1921, 6-0. I'm going to repeat what I said in my episode on the 1918 annual report for GM. Cars travel fast, and that can be dangerous. Why risk your life with some other brand when you trust Ford and are used to their Model T? Also, a car is a major investment for the average consumer. Why risk your money on an off-brand car that could break down when you trust Ford and the Model T has already proven itself? Ford had far more scale than anyone else, so they should have been able to have a cost advantage and therefore sell their cars at a lower price. Innovation and changing consumer tastes might shake up the car industry from time to time, but Ford made more cars than anyone. 
their engineers and factory workers had more experience and repetition making cars than anyone else. You learn best from practice, from tinkering, from trial and error, and no one else had the experience making the number of cars that Ford did. They had the most customers to go along with their expertise, so they should have been able to eventually detect changes in the car industry and changes in consumer taste. On top of all this, it is expensive to be in the car business. Car makers must spend a fortune in CapEx. Ford had profits rolling in from the Model T, so they had more funds than just about any existing car maker to pour into R&D and factory improvements. This was a fortunate position for Ford to be in during this time period. When I thought of how dominant the Model T was, it reminded me a little bit of two other businesses, Coca-Cola and Apple. One of the many advantages that Coca-Cola enjoyed throughout its history was that people were drinking the product. They were putting it into their bodies. People trusted Coca-Cola to be safe, along with being delicious and refreshing. Why risk putting some other brand into your body that is less trusted, especially since Coca-Cola can be purchased at such a low cost? Compare this with a car. People drive fast in a car, putting their life at risk. You really want to trust the car you are driving, especially back when this was a newer industry with newer companies operating in it. Although trust would seem to be even more important to the car business than with Coca-Cola, since the stakes are higher, the main difference is in terms of cost. Consumers were making a major investment when they purchased a car, leading to more incentives to do thorough research before purchasing. There is no need to research or negotiate the purchase of Coca-Cola. Apple's iPhone was another product that reminded me of the Model T. Both products were a piece of hardware that consumers loved and that changed the way people live their lives day to day. The iPhone ecosystem is a big reason why the iPhone has a stronger position than the Model T. The smaller, more incremental improvements in the iPhone come from apps that are developed. Apple's App Store is an ecosystem that allows third-party developers to create apps for the iPhone. Apple needs to make sure it innovates and keeps up with major leaps in technology, like if virtual reality causes the hardware to completely change away from the current iPhone. Third-party developers can help keep Apple up-to-date on incremental changes, though. You can listen to music on Spotify on both an iPhone and an Android phone. This level playing field allows Apple to maintain its position over the short term. In the auto business, Ford and GM had to continue innovating and improving themselves. They didn't really have a comparable system like the App Store and didn't really have third parties developing for them. Your mechanic or garage can fix your car, but it can't upgrade your car to next year's model. I used to think of Apple's ecosystem just in terms of a way that they could earn higher returns and higher profits on the infrastructure they already built. This still might be true, but the main point is that Apple doesn't have to always innovate or lead the way. Third parties can create cool applications, and then the iPhone benefits and isn't left behind by missing shifting trends. It makes all phones on a more level playing field, and if Apple already has the market share advantage, then this level playing field makes it tough to overtake the person in the lead. So what mistakes did Ford make? It missed the shift from open bodies to closed bodied cars. Ford and GM were located in Michigan, the same state I live in. I am shocked that the closed bodied car, one closed with a roof and doors, wouldn't be an obvious winner to anyone who experienced a Michigan winter. I don't see too many convertibles driving around in Michigan in January. The Model T was designed to have an open body, and so Ford needed a whole new design to adjust to the closed-bodied car. Ford was extremely slow and reluctant to shift away from the Model T to the closed-bodied concept. GM talked about the growing trend of the closed body in their 1919 annual report, and this was one reason why they acquired the Fisher Body Corporation that year. Ford didn't really respond fully until eight years later in 1927 when they shut down the River Rouge plant to retool. Eight years is a long time, 
This reminds me of a 2018 interview that Jeff Bezos gave to the Economic Club of Washington, D.C. Bezos was asked about Amazon Web Services, or AWS. He said that AWS benefited from a business miracle, saying, quote, At AWS, we completely reinvented the way that companies buy computation. Then a business miracle happened. This never happens. This is like the greatest piece of business luck in the history of business so far as I know. We faced no like-minded competition for seven years. It's unbelievable. When I launched Amazon.com in 1995, Barnes & Noble launched BarnesandNoble.com in 1997. Two years. That is very typical if you want to invent something new. We launched Kindle. Barnes & Noble launched Nook two years later. We launched Echo. Google launched Google Home two years later. When you pioneer, if you're lucky, you get a two-year head start. Nobody gets a seven-year head start. End quote. GM did not invent the closed-bodied car, but it did have an eight-year head start on Ford. As Bezos mentioned, this length of time is unheard of in business. Unfortunately for Ford, it was not the only example of this kind of delay. GM also formed GMAC in 1919 to finance the purchase of cars as well as to finance dealer inventory. Henry Ford was not a believer in this type of consumer credit. Due to this, Ford really didn't have a comparable financing program like GMAC until 1928 when Ford helped to form the Universal Credit Company. This means that GMAC had a nine-year head start over Ford's Universal Credit Company And this helped GM catch up to Ford during the 1920s as consumers could more easily afford a GM car. Ford had such a dominant position with the Model T in 1921 that it took multiple business miracles for them to get knocked off their top spot. Another shift that Ford missed was the rise of the used car market. Henry Ford's mission was to bring basic transportation to the masses at an affordable price. His Model T helped create this market, as the car was a static model that changed very little from one year to the next. Once the used car market formed, this became the lowest cost method for providing basic transportation. Drivers would buy a new car if they wanted something more than just basic transportation. I mentioned this in the last episode of mine on GM's 1920 annual report, but if Ford wanted to continue focusing on providing low cost, basic transportation, that would be fine. They would just have to go about it using a different business model. Ford could have revolutionized the car dealership business or set up a collection of mechanic and repair shops throughout the country. By the late 1920s, manufacturing new cars was not the way to achieve Henry Ford's original mission. I know my insight is due to the benefit of hindsight, but Ford had the right strategy at first in terms of focusing on just the Model T, gaining scale, and constantly improving operations, and then lowering the cost. But then the company needed to develop new products for other customers at higher economic levels. Instead of letting GM take a bite out of niche price classes, Ford should have done that by at least 1921 when it reached 60% market share. That way GM and Chevy wouldn't have reached the scale necessary to compete with Ford. The Ford Motor Company did acquire Lincoln in 1922 to enter the premium car market with a luxury vehicle. This was on a relatively small scale at the time. To hold off GM, Ford needed to get more aggressive with additional product lines, as well as in creating annual model changes and improvements. To close, I figured I would sum up all the difficulties of the car business that I've come across when making these episodes on General Motors. There are many. There was a rush of new entrants in the early days of the auto industry, and only a few successful companies emerged from the bunch. This makes competition tough, and it also makes it difficult for investors to pick out the winners that will emerge. There were many car companies that went out of business. Even among the winners, many of the founders lost control quickly due to the dilution that comes from raising equity capital. And equity capital was needed in large amounts. Car companies are required to spend a fortune on CapEx as inventory and PP&E is needed to operate. Product innovation is high, so that CapEx you spent 
and that inventory you piled up might be obsolete soon thereafter. Since product innovation is high, even a strong company might lose its spot to an emerging competitor if it is slow to react to changes happening in the industry. On top of all this, this is a labor-intensive business, and unionized labor will constantly want to negotiate for higher benefits. This could eat into your profits. Besides all that, things are great in the car business. So far, I have made episodes on Geico in the 1970s and on General Motors from 1918 to 1932. A big lesson that was reiterated to me in both of these examples is that execution is so important in business. Companies in competitive industries like insurance and auto manufacturing are even more exposed to execution risk than the average company would be. Geico had decades of good results and then was on the brink of bankruptcy after failing to raise prices for a few years while inflation was increasing at a double-digit percentage pace. General Motors ran into serious trouble after being slow to react to a drop-off in demand in 1920, allowing inventory to pile up and needing short-term debt financing. Ford had a dominant position in the auto industry and failed to react to changes in the market. No matter how great of a history you have or how strong your position in the industry is, your business must keep executing each and every day. That is where I'll leave off for this annual report. In the upcoming episodes, I'm going to take a look at a company called National Cash Register and then study a company called Teledyne. In the meantime, I'd love to hear any questions or comments from listeners. You can reach me at jacob at mcdonough-investments.com or on Twitter at mcd underscore investments. Thanks for listening.